everybody for uh, joining in and listening. I, I One thing I will say, I still, although I enjoy doing Zoom talks, I wish I was in Simsbury and doing it and uh, and, and seeing everybody in person. Uh, but that will happen at some point too. In any case, what I do in a talk is the talk will last half an hour, 45 minutes or so. The first half hour, I'll talk about what is an old book, first edition. Uh, I'll tell some stories and anecdotes of places I've been, books I've seen. Um, I'll show off a few of the things that I uh, have here, a little bit of show and tell, uh, give a little bit of my history in the store and so on. And then what I'd like to do in the last 10 or 15 minutes, if there are questions, is do question and answer because I can go on and on and on and on about old books. And at least with question and answer, I can go on about what you want to listen to. Uh, also, if a few people have some things we can try to do an appraisal, it's a little harder uh, on the screen. But anybody, uh, when I normally do talks, I do the appraisals at the end. But if anybody can't get them shown or don't want to, you can always get in touch with us either by email, pictures, calling, and uh, I'd be happy to try to do any and all verbal appraisals for you. I guess the first thing that comes up when you talk about old books is what is an old book? And usually people mean by that, what's a valuable old book? Well, the first printed book was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg Bible, let me assure you that it's valuable. Matter of fact, the last time one sold, half of it sold for over five and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between 50 and $100,000 on average. Uh, but any book printed in the 1400s has value. Some more than others, but anything in the 1400s is valuable. After that, it depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and uninteresting book then, and it's still a relatively dull and uninteresting book now. Nobody cares or would pay very much for it. On the other hand, you can have relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is only a little over 20 years old, has sold for upwards of $100,000. So it's all what people are looking for, what they want. Uh, and I get loads of calls at the store and people go, I have an old book. I know it's an old book. The way I know it's old is the pages are all brown and crumbling. And I point out that's more lousy paper than it is how old the book is. Now, this I'll hold up to the screen, but this is a page from a book, and you'll see it's not terribly fragile. The paper's white, the ink's black. It's one of the first books done with the illustrations. Uh, and this book was printed in the 1490s. So this page is a little over 500 years old. And a lot of times when I do the live talks, I'll pass this around so people can actually touch it. But uh, books at that point, there was a big disadvantage. Even though this was wonderfully made, in, at, in the 1400s, you had to be quite wealthy to get an education to learn how to read. You had to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like that. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they're at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dis dissemination of that knowledge. And I think it's a very good trade-off. Inevitably, when you collect uh, and talk about collecting books, somebody will come up and say, I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions never came out in a second edition, probably never should have come out in a, in a first edition to start with. Uh, they, uh, they, nobody cares. Nobody would pay anything for them. On the other hand, uh, books that are important, uh, maybe that they are uh, done by a famous author. Those are what people are looking for. And there are a lot of things that can make a big difference in collecting books or first editions. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust jacket 
on a 20th century book can make all the difference in the world. My father had a copy of William Faulkner's second book called Mosquitoes, absolutely pristine, as if someone took it from the publisher, sealed it away. At the time he got it, he sold it for $750. At the exact same time, another book dealer had the same book, Mosquitoes, Faulkner, first edition, but it didn't have the paper jacket, had a few tiny little nicks and bumps, nothing terrible. It took them a year to sell it at $40. Because a lot of collecting is prestige. <laughs> it's being able to say, look what I've got. I've got the best. I've got the most wonderful. Essentially, I've got what you don't have, and people who can afford it will pay absolute top dollar <laughs> for the very, very best, but might not spend anything at all for something slightly less. Other things that can affect the uh, value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author's unknown, unheard of, the fact that it's signed might not mean much. Maybe one of your relatives wrote a book of poetry, had 50 copies, signed it to family members. It might mean an awful lot to your family, but it doesn't mean that much to anybody else and doesn't have that much value. On the other hand, if it's signed by someone famous, maybe Ernest Hemingway, that could add hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to the value. And almost any type of thing, there are nuances that can add or subtract to the value. And I use sign books to show that off a little. There are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye, he was reclusive, he lived up in New Hampshire, he didn't appear in public, essentially didn't publish anymore. And other than to a very close personal friend, absolutely would not sign a book. And um, so his signature on a book adds thousands of dollars to the value. Um, A a couple of little side stories uh, about uh, Salinger, and this isn't the best way to introduce this, but uh, probably 35, 40 years ago, I hired an employee. Uh, He had worked at the store a few days. Uh, An older man came in was looking for an author named Donifred Yates, an obscure author, but I knew who it was. I went over, looked for it. We didn't have anything. I said to him, do you want to leave your name? He said, no, uh, you know, I'll try again. Uh, He left and my new employee came up to me. He said, does that man come in here often? And I said, you know, I really wasn't paying attention. Uh, I don't don't know. He goes, oh, well, that was J.D. Salinger. I used to date his daughter. And it was like, what? <laughs> and so you never know. And and sometimes it's the people and the characters. And one of the things that I really remember about this employee, we one time had one of the best or one of the most memorable introductions I've ever had. Uh, he w- it was about a month after this. I had tickets to a Celtics game. We had four tickets. My wife and I were going. We said, would you like a couple of tickets? He said, sure, but give them to me. I'll meet you there. My wife and I got there. He was sitting with a woman. Uh, He goes, oh, this is my wife, Mickey. We're getting divorced tomorrow. So you never know, both in the people, the customers, and so on. But in any case, there are also authors. So J.D. Salinger can really uh, add to the price. But there were some authors. There was a a man who was a friend of my father's who used to write uh, old books and books about the New England sea coast and buried treasure and pirate stories and so on. His name was Edward Rose Snow. And he used to, I knew him, and I remember one day he came into our shop and he said he had just been on Cape Cod and he'd gone into a bookstore that he had never been in before and Snow went right up to the section where his books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up and exclaimed, am I a rare unsigned copy? And then he took out a pen and signed it. And then he introduced himself to the owner of the store. So books signed by Edward Rose Snow don't add that much to the value. Uh, My father had a copy once of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. Now it was a first edition, but it didn't have the paper dust jacket. Uh, It was well worn and red, just sort of opposite what I was saying before about condition. But when you opened it up, it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. 
And in addition to that, T.S. Eliot annotated, crossed things out, added things in to almost every page of the book. That book now would be worth two, three, maybe even $400,000 because of the association. One last story about uh, autographed and signed books. There was an autograph and manuscript dealer in New England who was one of the more prominent in the world. Um, but when he was a young boy, he knew Robert Frost and he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he went to London when he was 13 years old. And he bought a copy of Frost's first book called A Boy's Will. Very complicated, what really was a first edition, but he paid a lot of money for it at the time came back to New England. A few weeks later, he met with Frost. He was very proud of himself. He said, look what I've got. Frost looked at it and said, well, what did you pay for it? And he told him, and Frost said, give me the book. Frost took, took it out, and on the front two end papers, he wrote a two-page description of how to tell the first binding from the second binding, from the third binding, from the fourth, how they change bindings, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages, signed it, closed the book, handed it back to the boy and said, now it's worth what you paid for it. So you, you never know. Uh, one of the things uh, that I like to do is give a little bit of my background and history of the store. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s. But for all practical purposes, it was um, going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married. My mother had $500. And with that, they bought half interest. Uh, and it's always been in Boston. People call us. They're on Brattle Street and Harvard Square saying, where are you? We tell them we're in downtown Boston. Uh, there used to be a street called Brattle Street in what was Scully Square. In the 1960s, the urban renewal uh, went through there in uh, not only is the store not there? The street doesn't even exist anymore to make it more confusing. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. And we've had seven different locations over the years, mainly due to urban renewal. And every time we'd move, when it was planned, my father would move the best books to his new location. And then he'd run sales, half price, dollar, 50 cent, quarter, dime. Last day of the sale, though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell. They'd go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again. That group would leave. The next group would come in. And he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969. And we were moving from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, um, there were books left over. My father was a bit of a character and a showman. And if you can sort of picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team. And on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, go west, book lovers, go 5 West Street, Brattle Bookshop. They filled it up with books and they drove it from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is. And then back down Washington with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend, told him he could do it all morning. Within an hour, the city was an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care. He'd gotten his point across. And uh, we've been on West Street since then. And when we first moved in, we were in a 150-year-old five-story wooden building, absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, uh, I, was, uh, I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire, and it literally burned to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. But we wanted to continue to keep going, not go out of business. Um, and uh, within a month, we uh, rented a storefront a few doors up the street, uh, rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us donated books. Kevin White, the mayor of Boston at the time, came down with a cow load. But within a month, we reopened. The main thing was just keep going. A month, uh, over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is a few doors down on West Street. And it's sort of the old Dickensian store. Outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors of general use books, and then a third floor with rare books, autographs, leather bindings, and so on. And it's 
that type of business, the large old general secondhand bookstore, especially in the inner cities, is a dying business. It's not dying because people don't like books, read books, sell books. It's dying because, especially in the cities, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which I can assure you are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have been going out of business. And in the last 10 or so years, the internet has just speeded that process along. And uh, like I say, we own our building, so we hope to be doing this for years to come. Uh, I have daughters who are in their early 30s. I don't think they have any interest in coming in, but I've been doing this all my life. My parents say my first word was book. I don't know. Maybe it was. I'm sure they were talking about them. And I worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. And then I was going to get a doctorate from the University of Wisconsin. But in 1973, I needed a year off. um, And my father's health wasn't that good. That year now has been over 40 years. And I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory somewhere. If you'd asked me one item that I wish I could find, there's a pamphlet here called Tamerlane by a Bostonian. Um, It doesn't look like very much. It was done in 1827. And uh, it's one of the classic rarities in American literature. Uh, The fruit, And of course, the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. It's his first book. And the first copy to ever really be found was found in the um, late 1800s on a dealer's 10 cent table. Another dealer spotted it there, bought a whole stack of books uh, so it wouldn't stand out. And in 1890, sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen who on the side were book scouts and being postmen, they knew where all the yard sales were were and all the books. And they uh, went to a yard sale, bought a trunk of books, bottom of the trunk is a Tamerlane. Families got involved. They got to negotiating. And uh, six months later, they sold it for $10,000. Now, I don't know if it was worth it because they started out best of friends. By the time they sold it, they never spoke again. And then about 20 years ago, there was an antique dealer who died in, the New, in southern New Hampshire. His whole estate was auctioned. Paintings, prints, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. Antique dealer put all the pamphlets in a box, $15 each. Somebody, of course, picked out a Tamerlane and 20 years ago sold it for $198,000. And one sold a few years ago for $800,000. And um, this is a facsimile. Uh, A lot of what I uh, handle and sort of will just do, uh, if it was original, I assure you I wouldn't. But it's one of the things that if you are home and then you go and check your attic, sellers, basements, whatever, if you ever find one of these, please give me a call. I'd love to hear about it. I have a letter here, Um, it's a little hard to see, but it's on White House stationery. It's dated April 11th, 1933. And it's uh, on, to dear Jim, I wanna send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's the most important post, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Signed Franklin Roosevelt. And it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. Now, on the surface, this seems like a great honor. It seems it's an ambassadorial appointment. Well, Curley was a character, and uh, he didn't think it was such an honor. Matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him, which, of course, he probably was. And Curley's response to Roosevelt was, remember, this was 1933. He said, in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? Now, Curley's opinion of Washington didn't change over the years. We also have 10 letters he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury prison. 
Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison and he wrote and he said to his wife, many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. In any case, not for Curley. Uh, other things I have here. Here's a program from the 1912 World Series. Um, if any of you are Yankees fans, they've had plenty of World Series too. But the Red Sox won the World Series in 1912, uh, went on a few times in the teens to win it, uh, and then the, at least Boston fans had to wait a long, long time. But not only is this interesting as a baseball item, but on the ad, back, there's an ad for arrow shirts and collars. Collars are two for a quarter, shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. I also have a brochure here for a ship. Tells you how wonderfully built it is, where to book passage, and anyone who wants to go on the Titanic. This is a program and brochure for the Titanic. And almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested. There are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. There's also a tendency, whenever you talk about books or book collecting, that all of a sudden everything seems to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I like to point out that old life magazines, not everything has to be high priced. This is one of Errol Flynn, another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. And the large majority, majority of these sell for a few dollars. Um, we used to have by a wall and a stairway at the store a few hundred of the more famous lifes hanging by that wall. And people would sometimes stop and stare at that wall for half an hour, an hour at a time, lost in thought and memory. They loved them for the stories, the articles, the photographs. They make wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you um, fall on the right dates. But we had a regular customer come in and it, he bought 50 life magazines from World War II and it wasn't what he normally bought. And I said to him, why are you buying these? And he said, well, I want to teach my children about World War II. And I guess nowadays with homeschooling, maybe this will be an idea for somebody, but I want to teach them about World War II. And he thought a nice way to do it would be to get some of the old lives, look at a few of the photos, read a couple of the articles and then discuss it with them. I thought it was a good idea, but I was skeptical. He came in a few weeks later and I said to him, how's it going with the lives? And he said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He says, the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs, but they love the ads. And he said, by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them more about what the United States was like during World War II than if they had read all the stories and so on anyways. Uh, I have a cookbook here from the 1700s. Some of the recipes are wonderful. And then you ha have how to cook eels the common way. One of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island, never knowing what you're going to see, who you're going to be the people, the places, the characters. I mean, tomorrow I'm driving to uh, just over the border from the, in the Berkshires. The next day I'm going to Bethel, Connecticut. The next day uh, my manager's going to Martha's Vineyard. So it's always going out. But I'll relate a few of those stories to you and uh, then maybe uh, either see about a few questions or I can keep going with stories. Uh, I got a call, this was a, a number of years ago, a lady left a message. I was out and uh, her name was Mrs. Fisher. I called her up and I said, she said, my father died in Providence. We have about 500 art reference books. We want to get the best price we can. We're inviting a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books sounded like a good library. Uh, Providence is only an hour from Boston. We go a lot further than that. So I was more than happy to. They lived on an old street out, up near Brown University called Benefit Street. I got to the house. It was a large old, second, uh, large old colonial house 
I get led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage, second floor of the garage, they had 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about eight, six to eight months, I bought 80% of the books I wanted. She was happy. I was pleased. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. Uh, would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport was one of the mansions on the ocean. Uh, and uh, I mentioned this to my wife, and this was one deal she decided to come with me on. And it was fascinating. At one point, I got to wa wander through this mansion that was still being lived in by a family without a tour guide going, come here, go here, do this, don't do that. I just wandered through the whole place all on my own. It was fascinating. Another time I got called to uh, Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I do groups like this, I usually, when I do them live, I do hundreds of free appraisals. But again, anyone who wants to get in touch or try to show me some things tonight, I'll try to do as best I can. But I, the main thing is I'll do whatever I can. My goal is that whenever you think of an old book that you think of me in the Brattle Bookshop, and one of the ways I feel I can do that is by giving out as much free information as reasonably possible. Um, but there are times when people need very formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes, whatever, and then I discuss a fee. Uh, in any case, another mansion in Newport, not quite as big um, as the um, Brown Mansion, but this was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. Um, and what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. Uh, but um, they would, these were the day-to-day -day accountings of the ships, and they were fascinating to read through. You, they would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page, and it said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last you heard of the captain. Uh, another time, we got a call. Well, my father was still alive, and he died over 35 years ago. Lady was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had. But we thought she might have some interesting books. So we, it was close by, so we went. We got to the house. It was a little ranch house. Paint was peeling. Weeds were growing. And we're saying, gee, what's going to be here? She answered the door. She was elderly. We walk in, and there were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. Well, it turned out she was from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe and all the court intrigues and all the goings on. How T.E. Shaw used to stay at that house all the time. How she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle. Uh, but there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy. But the stories were absolutely wonderful. And when we first got into the house on one of her walls, she had 10 watercolors, sort of pastoral European scenes. And when I first saw them, I thought they were nice. And the more she talked and the more we looked at them, the more I saw them, uh, I finally said, gee, those 10 watercolors are nice. And she turned around and matter of factly said, oh yes, they're all Turners. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of paintings. And it was sort of matter of factly, oh yes, they're all Turners. So you never know the people, the places, the characters. And matter of fact, speaking of characters, a few years ago, we went to one of our customer, un, customers, 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he tells you he just got back from Barcelona, he's going to give a talk in Florida, and he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said to him, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, 
It took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. He says, I don't think Tokyo is a whole lot further than that nowadays. And here's a man who can tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And he said he was looking forward to this dinner and all the learning and insight he was going to get from these men. And he said he got to the table a little bit early. And he said about five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And he said about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was elderly, had one of those big horns for hearing, sat down opposite them. And they said, uh, first thing he said, Ford turned to Edison and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Carter's little liver pills. This man said all night long, all they did was yell about Carter's little liver pills. And he said next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. Now, I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more, and then we'll see about some questions. And then I have a few other stories. And uh, in any case... We get hundreds of phone calls at the store, people wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get a book? Does the book exist? And most of those, either I or the people I work with, we can answer right off the top of our heads. Some are a little involved. Some take some real research, but that can be fun. But every once in a while, you get a call that really stands out. And again, this was a while ago, but I answered the phone. Hello, Brattle Bookshop. Can I help you? Lady, elderly, thick Irish brogue. And the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. Now, you have to admit, that gets your attention. She stopped and waited for it to sink in. And then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. Uh, she was his nursemaid. <laughs> and when he was two and three years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now, presidential letters of any type have value. Handwritten letters from later 20th century presidents are very scarce, rare, and high price. She wanted to get an offer. I was actually skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. I went to her house. She was great. The stories, she had great stories. The letters were fabulous. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer on them. But much as I suspected, there was no way she could sell these letters. Letters were part of her life. I left a note behind. Uh, as far as I know, her family still has them, probably where they belong. Maybe someday I'll hear about them again. But uh, like I say, at this point, why don't I see if there are some questions? And quite honestly, anything you ask me, I can go off on a tangent in any case. Uh, and we'll go from there. So I don't know if there are some or where we, how we uh, get into those. But I can. Let me know. Hi. So we did have a couple of questions as you were talking. Um, sure. I'm just going to run down them piece by piece. <clears throat> and the first one we had come in was, what is the best way to sell a collection of over 1,500 old books collected over the last 45 years, some which are probably worthless, but probably at least two to 300 are likely worth at least hundreds of dollars? Well, what, when people call us up, the first thing we ask is about how many. And you've said 1,500. Uh, it's interesting. The first question we ask is how many, and then we ask for what type. And a very common answer to that is a lot in fiction and nonfiction. And then we try to narrow it down from there. So uh, probably the next question I would ask on something like that, is there any particular subject, area, field, or something that you were, you know, particularly interested in. So that's one way. Uh, the other thing nowadays that are that really makes a lot of this easier is if the books are on shelves, uh, sort of like the books behind me, you can take digital pictures of those shelves. And if it's in focus, email them. And it doesn't have to be everything, but it, we can get a good idea of what you have. And if you think there are a few hundred that might be more valuable, sometimes you can take some pictures of those and we can say, well, the third book from the right, but it gives a sense. So, and it also depends on how valuable the books are. In other words, when we go out, they, a lot of times people will come out, will give an offer on a library. And the first question you'd think would be, gee, do you think you could go a little higher or should it be a little more or what? Usually the first question is, are you going to take everything? 
because most people when we leave don't want any books left because they're moving or it's an estate and they're clearing it out but it all depends on what your circumstances are are you actually looking to sell the whole collection do you want to sell it bits and pieces and the you can have more and more and more options the more valuable that the books actually are in other words if if you have a 1500 book collection and a few of them are worth a few hundred dollars sure i'm going to be interested i'll look if it's good enough we'll drive all over new england the northeast to buy them if a few of those books are worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars not only would i be interested probably every other book dealer in the world would be interested every auction gallery in the world would be interested and then you can always try to figure out what your best uh options are also what your family wants to do how you want to take care of it but we always encourage people to send photos and we will always give information about it uh verbally at no charge or obligation and i mean when i do these talks that's the type of thing i want to hear because that's the fun part for me so what i would suggest is uh maybe taking some pictures uh there are a lot more efficient than a list because we can actually see condition addition and then we can ask questions from there and the other very important thing that whenever anyone's selling something i always tell them whoever's involved be it you your family anyone else go through it and see if there's anything you want to keep in other words are there books that are sentimentally valuable or may, they mean something because when a dealer when an auctioneer when another person whether you're donating them or keeping them goes through quite honestly if someone wants to take one book out and they start like oh wait a minute uncle harry gave me that one oh wait a minute so do that all beforehand because we can uh you know that's more the personal part and many times the sentimental collecting in is the hardest part in selling something once that once you get past that then it's just money you know although money is very very important uh it either works or it doesn't work that's simple whereas the one that was handed down through the family generation after generation that's a lot of times a lot more attached and a lot harder to deal with anyways that's a quick answer but any question that i answer here tonight uh i will say that you can go on our website you can call you can get in touch and i'll try to help or the staff here will try to help as best we can anyways that's that's part a part answer that could go on forever thank you for that so our next question is what book should i start keeping for future value the question of uh, being what books for uh keeping for future value if i could tell you what books are going to be absolutely valuable for the future and if you can predict the future i'd advise lottery tickets i think you'd do a lot better financially if you can tell the future but quite honestly uh and this is almost like a clichéd statement <laughs> collect something you like collect something you enjoy because a lot of the fun of collecting is not only building up something that you have but it's going out on the road maybe stopping when you're on a trip driving your family crazy at every antique store every flea market every small auction or the larger bigger auctions and um uh, and it's the hunt it's the finding thing matter of fact i've many times had customers and collectors who have been looking for books for 30 40 years even they find them and it's almost disappointing because they don't have that book to look for anymore but they always have more so <coughs> The first thing I would say find an area subject that you like that you enjoy for whatever reason maybe it has to do with your work maybe it has to do with somewhere where you live or maybe you just happen to walk into some place one time saw something and said hey that looks nice um uh, maybe it has to do, do with school the other thing is when you're first starting out ask questions in other words go to bookstores ask the book dealers go to there are book shows well there are book shows when you can have book shows uh right now they're gone virtual but a lot of times there are book shows where you'll have 50 100 dealers all in one place and walk around 
see what different things there are, see what's out there. Uh, also ask questions. And one of the problems when you go to most book dealers who are in this field are in it because they love it and enjoy it. And when you ask somebody who loves what they do a question, the problem usually isn't getting them to answer. It's getting them to stop answering. Uh, also, when you collect, you might start out saying, you know, I really like books on automobiles. I collect books on old cars and that. And maybe six months, a year down the road, you say, wait a minute, I like this better. Well, don't be afraid of changing or collecting in two areas. Also, nobody knows everything about everything. They nev you never will. And if you did, it would probably get very boring. So there's nothing wrong with asking people. You get to know other people who collect what you like. And, uh, and, and it goes from there. So it sort of builds on each other. But the main thing I would say, the, the two things I would say is get to know, or three things, I can keep adding things, get to know people, dealers who you feel comfortable with, that you enjoy being with, that maybe know what you're collecting. Ask questions, because as you start collecting, you'll get to be more and more knowledgeable, and you'll know when something's priced fairly. You'll know when something might be a bargain and you want to pick it up. Also, don't be afraid to make a mistake. I've had a few collectors tell me, well, I've been collecting for 20 years and I've never made a mistake. And my first reaction is, I might not say it to them, I might say it to them, is the biggest mistake you've made is never making a mistake. Is if you say you've never made a mistake, it means you've probably passed up loads and loads of things that you should have bought but you were too conservative. And the few mistakes you made in, you know, where you paid too much for something or it wasn't quite what it, those few things, uh, they'll be insignificant. Uh, it will always be the one that got away that will bother you. So uh, I would start there. Also, if you can do it, it's always better to try to collect the best things you can within whatever your area is. Um, in other words, if you can afford it, pay a little extra to get the better copy than the so-so one. Um, and you'll find as you're collecting, though, you'll probably always be upgrading certain things. So, again, that's sort of a, a longer answer, but make sure you enjoy it because the real fun is the hunt, the enjoying, and the meeting other people. It's also a good idea to collect something you can afford because, you know, if you're collecting uh, only original Autobahns, and you can only afford a few hundred dollars, you're going to be very frustrated because nothing's going to turn up. On the other hand, you also want to collect something that's available. If you only want to collect books printed about Sir Francis Drake in Francis Drake's lifetime, even if you have a lot of money, there's not much out there. So a lot of times collect things that you can actually find and enjoy and can afford and have fun with. At least that's a start. That's really great advice. Thank you. We do have one more question, and then we did have a couple uh, participants who were wondering if you could look at their books. Okay, we'll do both. All right. So the last question we have right now is, what is the best reference guide that you would recommend to use to price books? Uh, I don't think there is any one reference guide. Uh, it, there are thousands and thousands of books about books and book collecting. Probably, I almost hate to say this, but the online services like A Books and there are a few others, ones called Add All, are probably good places to look. Uh, you have to be very careful of those. And part of the reason you have to be careful is many people who post things on that don't know what they're doing. So you you can have the blind leading the blind almost in that you know, you'll see something and it won't make any sense, or you'll find one that's a dollar and one that's a thousand dollars, and there's no real difference, and there might be no difference. Uh, so most people who are on those are not trying to deceive, but many don't know what they're doing. If you look at, if you look at those services, though, what I tell people is the first thing is do not look at the price. 
look at how many are available. In other words, if you have a book and you want to see what it might be or what the uh, cost might be, uh, you can look. And if there are 100 copies, that tells you right away there are loads of them out there. Uh, they're easy to get, and almost all of those 100 online aren't selling at whatever price they're at. And then people will come to me and sometimes say, well, we saw a lot online, and we feel the high was here, the low was there, and we should get somewhere in the middle. And I say, no. If you were buying it, you're going to go to the lowest price of the good copies. Uh, and so there are three ways when you're online to sell books as a dealer. One is to have the only copy. The other is to have the best copy. And the third is to have the cheapest. But at least those online services will give you a sense of how available it is, They'll, a lot of the dealers write good descriptions on it. If you start looking and seeing one or two particular dealers are constantly ones who have books that you are interested in, and they write good descriptions, well, maybe get in touch directly with them or call a dealer. There's an organization called the Antiquarian Bookman's Association of America, ABAA. If you Google ABAA, it will come up, and there are about 400 better dealers. And you know, if you again, if you call and ask questions, that's one of the best ways to start. And if you say, I'm collecting this type of book and that type of book, many of us will tell you, well, this is the reference book you should use, or these are the dealers you should particularly get their catalogs or look online and what they have. So again, asking questions of professionals or people you get along with who might collect in the area and saying, what should I collect essentially than just starting out of the blue would probably be what I think the best thing is. Ask people who know, find the ones that you like and get along with. And in most cases, they'll help you a lot and get you in the right direction, save you a lot of time. Great. So. Thank you. So we didn't have any other questions come in during that time. So we can maybe move on to the appraisal part, if you're okay with that. Well, as long as I can see it, then then we'll we'll do it. Sure thing. I am going to stop the recording now since we want to protect everyone's privacy. So just a moment for that. One of the things that I do when I've done for 20 years, and I hope people watch, is the Antiques Roadshow. And that's a lot of fun to do. Uh, the Antiques Roadshow, the way that show works is you um, appraise in a day. It used to be just weekends. Now it's sometimes uh, during the weekdays. But three to 5,000 people come to a show. Uh, there's three book appraisers sitting next to the print appraisers, just next to the music appraisers, jewelry, ex so on and so forth. And you appraise all day long for um, probably – sometimes from 7.30 in the morning, sometimes till 6, 7 at night, nonstop, uh, hoping that something good will come in and you get on TV. Uh, the appraisers aren't guaranteed. We pay our own way. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. You see and meet a lot of people. There's a lot of sociability. And it's a great way to see the United States. Anywhere you go in this country and you make any type of effort, the people are wonderful. The, it's the scenery is beautiful. Don't talk about politics and religion. That's that. Uh, but when we do a praise, there was the appraisers have to get there even earlier. And there's one of the shows, the three book appraisers we're sitting, we said, how many Bibles do you think we'll see today? And uh, we counted 80, 80 family Bibles in one day in one show. Now, sometimes, depending on who the appraisers are, we have a little pool going at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to finish with uh, two quick stories. There are sometimes people collect books because they have very decorative cloth covers. You can go to library sales, book sales, bookstores, and pick these up relatively cheaply. Uh, before they had dust jackets, a lot of publishers would do very nicely done uh, covers because they wanted the books to catch your eyes. And there are some that are expensive, but you can get them cheaply. And I actually have a collect. Sometimes people ask me, do you collect? And I don't collect much because I've got a store full and whatever. But one day I got a book. It had a picture of a toilet on the cover. And the title of the book was Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper, uh, who invented the toilet. And I brought it home. I showed it to my wife. She took one look at it and said, 
we have to put that in the bathroom. So we did. The next day I got another book and it had a big eye staring out of the cover. Um, and we figured, well, with a big eye staring at you, you got to put that in the bathroom too. Now this is a little half bathroom, so there's no shower, no steam. And next thing you know, we built bookshelves. And now we have about 400 of these Victorian style illustrated uh, covers in the bathroom or books. And people walk in, they're a little taken aback, loads of reading material. And one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable is every once in a while a book falls off the shelf and you can imagine where it ends up. Last, last story, uh, and I'll also throw in at the end of that one little plug for things, but um, I got a call at, to a large old church in Boston, very large church, well over a hundred years old. And what they wanted me to do is they had a huge library that they had just accumulated over the years. And um, I spent a day there. They actually had some good books. It was fun. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There are a few more books. Went down the basement, looked at the books. And then in one corner of the basement, there was a closet. And the priest opened the door, floor to ceiling, top to bottom, front to back. He was stuffed full of thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I said, what is this? And he said, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the closet. And he says, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. That would just be terrible. So I use it as an example to say, if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, it's fabulous. But if all you're doing is taking your old stuff and just giving it to somebody else who it becomes their old stuff, you're really not doing anyone a favor. A couple of things I'll mention is don't ever hesitate, and you can go to our website, Brattle Bookshop, uh, asking us questions. We'd rather have 100 people call with nothing special than to have the hundred first person say, I just threw away a Tamerlane. And uh, I do a podcast, it's called Brattlecast. And if you like these stories, I think we've got about 85, 15 to 20 minute ones. We put one out every two weeks. And um, I just keep telling stories because books are a never ending uh, with the stories, the people, the characters. And you never know what people are going to want. We got a collection in cookbooks, wonderful collection. Uh, there was a bunch of old little pamphlets about how to make jello, how to do this. I said to one of my assistants, why don't you just put them all out on the dollar table? Some are worth more, but whatever. An hour later, some customer comes running in beside himself. Absolutely wonderful. He said, I've been looking for this for years and years and years. And he was just thrilled. And it's a dollar. And I look at it and the title is Coconuts and Constipation. So you never know, and, uh, and mainly books of fun, and that's what I try to get across. So thank you all for listening in. Get in touch if you have questions. Um, I love talking about them. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.